Hello, welcome and a very good evening. And today we have a special guest. It's someone you probably know, most probably know. It's the C64. It's a C64G to be precise. You can probably see it here on the sticker. And this is the cost reduced version of the original C64. You can notice that it has the white or at the moment yellow keys um, because they yellowed over the years obviously. This particular model was made in West Germany and it's looking a little bit different on the inside, has few fewer chips. Uh, there were some cost cutting measures that Commodore did but it still comes in the lovely bread bin box. As a kid I never owned a C64 when I was at university, I bought one, I think on the flea market or something, uh, for pretty cheap because that was something like 20 years ago almost. And um, by that time, they were really cheap. After a few years, I gave it away to a friend who is collecting C64s and everything, C64, and I think he probably still has that machine. And it came with the floppy drive and cables and everything, so. I think it got a very nice home and I think it even came in box. So today that would be a pretty expensive machine. But uh, I didn't have any use for it back then and not enough storage space either. So I think it got a good home. But um, the other day a uh, guy from the DOS Reloaded forums, someone you actually know from the Tandy sound card by the name of Matze79 offered up a bunch of C64Gs, which he restored or got up back to working condition, um, repaired a few things, probably cleaned them from the outside as best as he could. And um, I took one of those and they were more or less a bargain, uh, but they were a bargain because they came naked like this and they have a few problems. For example, this one here has two 3D printed keys, which are kind of nice, but um, we might want to replace that. And I have something in mind for that. Uh, a very simple solution, actually, but uh, we'll come to that in a minute. And also, this one didn't have a SID chip. So it's got a SWIN SID now, which we already um, saw in the Renovation 2001 video, with a PC sound card, the SID chip um yeah so i'll it works i tried it out but i probably want to replace it with uh, something a little bit better the swinset is not that bad actually but um, due to its lacking filters and also it doesn't have any analog inputs for pedal controls some things might not work some software will not work correctly if you need pedals for like pong games or stuff like that or if you want to code your own a measuring device uh, you can actually attach sensors to the um, C64 like a temperature sensor and read that out via the SID chip that will not work um, so we want to replace that with something more proper let's say and furthermore uh, something that I can't do anything about is it's got a melted dent in here but that's just the way it is I mean this device is probably definitely more than 30 years old, but probably between 30 and 35 years. Once we open it up, we can take a look at the time codes on the other chips, and that will give us a hint roughly when this was produced. Um, yeah, but for now, I would say that's enough of an introduction. Let's open up this device, uh, have a look and make a plan what to do with this. I also have a bunch of cables now to uh, actually attach this to my Amiga monitor and get it up and running. So let's do it. All right, here's the nice C64G and you can see the, the buttons here. And yeah, um, first of all, what I'm gonna do probably is I got a hold of another keyboard and it's lightly less yellowed. I mean, I probably will um, retrobrite this whole thing anyway, 
to take off the yellowing because right now the the white balance actually shows it much whiter than it is it's really a bit of a nasty yellow but i mean you can you can leave it like that if you want but i want to try to get it look more pristine and um this should actually fit this is also from a c64g i think um so instead of just replacing the keys because they won't color match i will just take out the whole uh keyboard assembly and put this one in and one thing to note is that this one actually has slightly a lighter colored uh, function keys i'm not sure why but probably there was a bit of variation during the uh, production of the c64 i mean there were millions produced and they perhaps also had different suppliers for for things like the keyboard so let's turn it over this one is also missing its rubber feet um i probably will buy some replacement rubber feet from our Bauhaus or similar DIY store and yeah I mean it's not strictly necessary but it's nicer depending on where you place the thing and it will not slide around on the table or such. So this one was obviously opened before first by whoever had this initially and pulled out the SID chip because the SID chips are actually used in synthesizers and other stuff and people will rip apart C64s which is a bit sad to get to the SID chips and um, or maybe it was broken I don't know and Matze was so nice to put in a swin SID which is perfectly fine uh, in and of itself and I played a couple of games with the Swinsit and they sounded reasonably fine but I think some of the demo scene productions which make use of the filters or some certain games will sound weird and I'm wondering if we can get the screws out probably not they will probably fall down yeah there was the first screw Let's see if we can find it before it goes away completely got it and then we will try to open it up and it seems to come apart yes however also we need to make sure to oh there's the drf shield it's still in there which is kind of good i think and there is the power led note that it sits on top here like that so the rightmost pin is empty and red is to the right we will take note of that and the keyboard cable white is at the bottom white and black are at the bottom okay i think we can also pull that one out safely and the keyboard is stuck in place with many more screws but we'll look at that a little bit later and now we should be able to do something with the cardboard well, where is it attached i'm not quite sure it's stuck below there okay we need to first get away with the screws and I think to have a proper look, we need to unscrew a few things here. Quite a lot of screws, actually. Also noteworthy, there are two different kinds of screws holding down the PCB. One is a metal screw, because um, there is a metal bracket uh, for the ports, and a plastic screw, which attaches to the actual case, obviously. At this point, I'm actually really wondering how Matze got this out, because I can already see the um, swinset here. And down here is another screw, and uh, the whole stupid cardboard RF shield, which I don't want to destroy because it's pretty original. Um, it's uh, stuck in place here, and I can't remove that. All the other screws are out. 
but it stuck beneath the PCB and I think I can't pull it out. So I need to get somehow down there without destroying the precious cardboard. Okay, I feel pretty stupid now. Um, this was actually just clipped on here on the, I think this is the user port and then the RF shield for the user port. So yeah, it was actually pretty simple. And um, yeah, this is the, the cardboard RF shield and you don't get any cheaper than that. And uh, yeah, we can take a small tour now of the PCB. Let's zoom in a little bit. So down here we have the swing sit, which looks interesting because really dominating that thing is a huge 32 megahertz crystal powering or clocking, clocking the Atmel that is probably on the bottom of the PCB. We will see once we pull it out. The whole thing looks pretty original. I don't think that um, Mazda replaced any of the capacitors from the looks of it. So I think that's fine. Um, down here we have the RAM. And those are not really matching. There's one 150 nanosecond and one 120 nanosecond chip. So maybe one of those were replaced because it would be weird to have two different ones. Um, then let's have another look at the rest of the board. So on the right side on the board, we have the MOS 6526A, which is the CIA. And this is socketed, so I suspect that it might have been bad. Not 100% sure. Um, but since it uses machined, uh, machined sockets, I think it was probably defective and was replaced at one point or another. Um, yeah, for those fans playing home, uh, along at home, it's a assembly number 250469. I have no idea if this is rare or anything. I doubt it, but people will probably know if that's any good. The 8565R2 is, as far as I know, the VIC-2 chip. It's socketed, but it uses a non-machined uh, socket, so probably it was like that. The chip right next to it, the 8701, is I think the clock generator, a small chip by MOS. Um, this LH5062B is I think a memory controller with a lot of legs uh, it's also leading to the 64 kilobytes of RAM which gives rise to the name C64. The MOS 8500 is the CPU. Here we have the uh, kernel and basic ROMs. I don't know which is which, but uh, one can probably look it up, but I'm too lazy. And there's another CIA over here. The CIA doing all the interfacing with the keyboard and all the external stuff. Okay, so that's that. Um, all that's left is to replace the uh, SID, the SWIN SID, which I keep. We have um, two options here, but I will have to check because I think one of the options won't work. Um, namely, putting in an original SID chip. And I think this won't work because I only have the 6581. And I think this one is not compatible because it uses 12 volts or something. Uh, but I look it up before pl plugging it in. And this is already using the eight something chips, which I think use nine volts or something. Um, so make sure that you get the right SID chip. But one that we can definitely use and which is definitely better than the Swin SID is the ARM SID, which still sits here on my renovation sound card. And um, yeah, this is done by Nobumi from Czech Republic. And it's um, a better version of the Swinsit. No, it's a completely different version. It uses also a slightly different chip. 
obviously because uh, this one is arm based and this one is uh, metal based so actually it's a very different chip and yeah it sounds better it's much closer to the original sit and i'll pull it from the card here because i think the c64 might see more action um, than the renovation and i think for the renovation i can also use the 6581 so i will still have two devices with a proper sit sound basically yeah so let's pull that out and replace it so having pulled it out you can compare it to my other swinsit and actually this is the 32 megahertz oscillator on my swinsit and this is the one that i found in this machine and the actual atmel mcu sits underneath that huge crystal so yeah that's amazing um but I think we can close the lid on this one. The C64G um, definitely used the uh, later 8580 variant, I think. So this should be only 9 volts. So the 6581 won't work on there. I will put the arm sit in here because I think it's a good place for it. Because uh, this machine will see some action. And uh, I think it's a very good Thing. Also, I noticed all the chips on here are week 43, 1988 or earlier, except for this CIA. So this was definitely replaced, I would say. And this places the machine towards the end of 1988, maybe early 1989. Um, I mean, this one here has 0789, so it could be the original chip, but I doubt it, because everything else is like week 38, 243. So I would guess it would be end of 1988. Commodore was probably um, producing as much machines as they were producing chips in their MOS factory. So yeah, I hope that sort of makes sense. Um, I'm not sure if we can find out any more from when it is. Uh, I mean, back here in the lower left corner, we can see also week 3888, but that's probably just the board revision. Um, when this was designed or printed and the chips are a little bit later so i'm gonna plug in the arm set and then we can swap the keyboard out and get the machine running so very quick chip replacement and the arm set is in place i think it actually looks really fine i like that the pcb of the arm set has all the components on the underside as you can see here probably so it really fits in nicely, plus it definitely has the better sound quality. And I think this should be one happy C64 when we close it, hopefully, because I hope we didn't destroy anything. Um, but I don't think so. These are relatively sturdy, except for the chips, of course. The chips are very sensitive to electrostatic discharge, especially the SID, so whenever I can, I will not handle the SID chip as much as as possible, basically. All right, um, let's swap over to the keyboard. Put this aside for a second. The keyboard is, uh, should be very simple. It's just a ton of screws. And yeah, that's about it. Uh, yeah, let's unscrew it and swap in the other keyboard. There it is, a very fast keyboard swap. Looks and feels good, uh, especially the two keys are back in place. I will of course, and the yellowing actually matches very nicely, um, I will keep my eyes peeled for replacement keys for the other keyboard because I think that is still restorable, um, of course. Plus, yeah, I definitely want to retro bright this because the yellowing, especially here, is pretty nasty. Also, I think um, Mats already tried, but maybe I will try again with a magic eraser. Uh, there's still some <laughs> stuff written here. It says lance, axe, sword, and pause. 
So somebody can probably figure out which game that was that this person was playing a lot, obviously. Um, I have no clue. Uh, and it says here run and deer on the left. Probably some shortcuts, maybe there's some special like Jiffy DOS thingy, or I don't know. I don't have any modifications on my 1541 or the C64. So yeah, I'm gonna plug this back together and then we'll have a look if it runs and if the arm set works as expected. Right, all the screws are in, except for this one. And this is one of the metal screws, but I already put both metal screws in there, and I only have one hole left. I will leave this, I think, um, up here where the connectors are. I have put in all the plastic screws. I don't think this is uh, necessarily a good thing to put this in here. Oh, does it hold? It seems to hold. But I think there was a mix-up at one point um, regarding the screws. I'm gonna put pull this out. This is not really taking. Um, you have to be careful with plastic screws because the plastic will be brittle and destroyed very easily. And I think it will hold in place just fine like this. And it wasn't the original screw anyway. So all that's left to do is clip on the RF shield, uh, which is interestingly cheap and really really cheap I really mean that then we need to of course put in the where was it oh here the connector for the led that was offset by one and red was to the right that should be okay plus the cable for the keyboard, which is a bit tighter. Let's tie it up with two cable ties. So let's see if we can connect that. And it's in. That's nice. Let's close up the case. And there we go. Actually, there we don't go. There's a gap still in here. So I did something wrong, which is, I guess, this part here. Um, I might have to undo the screws. I think there's something jammed here. Yeah, uh, I'll be back in a second. All right, now we're back in business. This looks fine. And um, the thing that I showed you before this year, this could have been properly melted, I don't know, from heat, or maybe even the power cord or floppy cable or something was here because they contain chemicals that make plastic soft and over the years this can actually lead to such melting. But uh, due to the discoloration this could also just be, I don't know, some something hot, like a soldering iron or I don't know what, touching it. Uh, but it looks like it has been this way for a long time. And another interesting thing is uh, there were warranty seals here by Quelle, which is the German version of Sears, more or less a mail order shop. I don't think they exist anymore, but people would buy stuff like the C64 via mail order from shops like Quelle. And yeah, um, I think this is a very lovely device. Let's put some power in there, attach a floppy drive. I got a floppy drive from around the corner here. Someone was selling it and uh, let's run some programs. Okay, so let's try and turn the machine on. I hope nothing explodes. Here goes nothing and it works fine. Commodore 64 Basic version 2. Let's see, uh, it should run, of course, basic. Um, hello world, let's do a hello world, that's fine. Hello world, 
I'm sorry if the colors don't come out very well. The CRT is actually pretty hard to film. Uh, 20, 20, go to 10. We could do a little bit more interesting stuff, but I think, yeah, this is enough for right now. And let's actually fire up some games and demos to see the arm sit in action and a bit more of the graphics capabilities of the C64. The first game we look at is Zeta Wing by Sarah Jane Avery. And this is a brand new game just released in 2020. And it's a shoot 'em up, vertical scrolling shoot 'em up. And it's only 32 kilobytes in size. And it reminds me very much of Musha Aleste from the Mega Drive. Although I think um, it lends to a lot of different shoot 'em ups. And I must say, it's a very excellent game for the C64 and I'm very impressed with it and I probably will make a short review of this. It's definitely worth checking out and it works just fine. Second up is the demo Second Reality by Smash Designs, a remake of the classic and very famous PC demo of the same name and it shows in a very impressive manner what the C64 can actually do because the demo looks amazingly similar and sounds also very similar to the original PC demo. I mean there are obviously a lot of differences like uh, the frame rate will be different, the colors will be off, the models look slightly different, the SIDCHIP has only three voices. But still, it's amazing to see this, for example, this 3D scroller here. I couldn't have imagined that this is actually possible on the C64. And it's one of my favorite demos of the C64 and of all time, actually, because, yeah, it rocks. Rainbow Islands is a classic game, arcade game, actually, and the C64 port is exceptionally well done. It's very colorful and uh, it's a very good test of the screen, well, quality and capabilities of the C64. And yeah, even this one here passes the tests with flying colors. The arm sit in the background plays the nice soundtrack and the sound effects. And yeah, I can definitely recommend this game. It's quite a lot of fun. Easy to learn, hard to master as every good arcade game. I think Zagnet Kraken needs no introduction. I use this game a lot for showing off different things, even on the PC, the Tendi sound card, etc. So yeah, it's one of my favorite adventure games of all time, and it runs perfectly fine on my repaired C64G. Last but not least, this is Diagonality by the Genesis Project. It's a demo from this year actually, it's uh, released in 2020 and it shows off some very nice effects and this part here in particular is interesting because it uses the SID filters quite heavily, which the arm SID has. So, what do you think about the C64G? Was it worth it uh, exchanging all the stuff? And do I have fun with the device? I would say definitely so. Uh, the C64 is an awesome machine, even though I never had one as a kid. I only got one 20 years ago or so, and then gave it away again. But rediscovering it for the second or third time um, is actually a very pleasant experience. It is an awesome machine. There's a lot of nice homebrew going on in the scene. There are lovely demos which really show what this device can do. And it's more or less easy to repair. There's a lot of spare parts available like the keyboard. I will still be um, on the lookout for the missing keys um, that are missing on the other keyboard because I think it would be a shame not to use that keyboard. Uh, so if someone knows where to 
get replacement keys. I think there was some form of Kickstarter or other for um, replacement keycaps, complete new replacement keycaps. I mean, I only need one or two that would suffice actually, but that will probably be a bit harder to come by. But anyway, um, yeah, I can definitely um, recommend having one of these around. And there are still some minor things, as I said, uh, some retro writing will be definitely be done at some point, maybe next year. I'm not sure if I'll do it in winter, because in winter I might have to buy some UV lights. I don't know. Um, the machine is clean, it works, so this is purely cosmetical. And uh, it's also nice because it shows that this device is more than 30 years old and it can show a little bit of yellowing or <laughs> crazy amounts of yellowing on this device. Um, but yeah, as I said, it's it's a whole lot of fun. Uh, the C64 is definitely one of the seminal machines and having one is definitely awesome and it uh, complements very well my Atari 2600 and the Amiga. So that's very appreciated to have this. Uh, if you want, I can do more videos on this machine. There are more things to explore. The 1541 uh, disk drive, for example, or a little bit of coding or other stuff. Let me know in the comments what interests you. And uh, if you haven't, please consider subscribing. Share this video on your favorite social media. Give it a thumbs up or thumbs down, depending on how you liked it. And I hope to see you next time. And if you want to support me in any other way, there is a Patreon link and a Ko-fi link, also a PayPal link. If you don't want to support me in that way, that's fine, or you probably can't do that. It's all great. I hope you have a very nice evening, and I hope that you also have fun with your retro computers. So, see you next time.